Well, first of all, thank you to uh, uh, Kathy and Kyle uh, for inviting the foundation to participate in this event. This is a very impressive group of people that are assembled here, and honestly, we are honored to be part of this event and to have a speaking role of any type at this event. Uh, you all are the innovators that are pushing the world forward in many ways. What I tried to do here in putting this together is I'm going to try to accomplish three things in a very rapid amount of time. One is to let you know why the Gates Foundation cares about this particular innovative space. You may not know about the work that we do. Two, to kind of put your brains for a second in 15 years out. What is the world going to look like 15 years out? And then how can we make that world come to pass more quickly is the third thing I want to try to do. So, why we care about this space is in the United States and all around the world, folks who get a uh, advanced degree, a post-secondary or tertiary degree, earn a lot more money than if you just get a high school diploma. About 10 years ago, uh, the foundation started its work in US education, and an outgrowth of that work has been we're increasing the graduation rates in high schools, but we realized very clearly that a post-secondary or tertiary degree is really needed to advance people's lives in the world in this 21st century. Uh, if you earn a bachelor's degree, you earn 98% more over the course of your life than if you just get a high school diploma. If you earn a master's degree, it's even more. And then there's lifelong learning that many of you in this room and many, many of our, our fellow colleagues that are not here engage in to get even higher salary levels in the economy. And there's something that we can do to drive that education agenda. Also, many of you know that the economies that are most successful in the world are the ones that are really thinking about their human capital, really building more uh, uh, education pathways, building more colleges, innovating more in their post-secondary arena, and getting more people to those higher levels of learning that lead to those better jobs that lead to a stronger economy. So is there something that can be done to actually move an entire nation? The answer is definitely yes. Uh, in 1950, less than 10% of Americans had a bachelor's degree. Now that number is a little bit above 40% if you look at folks who are age 25 to age 64. And this chart shows, and you may not be able to see all the details, the changes that have happened in the last 12 years in all the OECD countries around the world. Let me point you to Ireland, which is three quarters of the way down the line. Ireland has gone from less than 30% to above 40% in the last 15 years. And this is during the time when Ireland went bankrupt and recovered and is now in a much better place. If you actually have a governmental policy that's focused on investing in the people that live there and getting them that higher education, you can move quite a bit of your society. Now the US has not moved very much in the last few years, but other countries are moving much more aggressively to address this need for higher learning in their populations. And the reason why I put this slide up is to remind you that in the United States, we did something like this ourselves. There was the GI Bill, there was the Higher Education Act in the 50s and 60s. That's where our population went from 10% of higher ed attainment to 40% of higher ed attainment, but we've kind of been stuck at 40%. You'll notice also I'm going to kind of go back and forth between US-centric and global-centric as I push through these slides. So the next 15 years, these are the nations that are focused on really driving higher education attainment. And it won't surprise you very much if you study this like we do. China and India are really pushing the way, building lots of colleges and universities, spending lots of their budget on trying to get this type of tertiary education for their populations. There are questions about the quality of those schools, but I'm going to kind of skip past that in a way because I'll explain why a little bit later, that these investments do matter. These investments do lead to higher order jobs. These investments do lead to a better economy, and investing in education is one of the best things that societies can do to move themselves forward. We live in higher education, all of us here, and there's been kind of a... Uh, a rush of new books. Uh, oh, dear, we're just talking about, you know, since 2007, something is different here. Something is very different in the last 36 months. Perhaps since the advent of MOOCs, although we know that MOOCs were just kind of a canary uh, peeping in the coal mine, that something is big going on here where online and blended learning are no longer in the backwater of higher education institutions. They are now in the forefront. More presidents and provosts say that online and, and digital learning is very important to the future of their institutions. And more and more books are being written about how does 
uh, higher education in America, in the world, actually get through this transformation. So if you go up a level for a second, our world is being transformed. The internet is eating industries. There are no longer very many bookstores. There are some bookstores that are surviving, but for the most part, books have moved online, being sold by Amazon. Books are no longer in book form, as we were just talking about. Books are now digital. We are all, according to Mary Meeker's report from last week, now reading more on our mobile phones than we are on our computers. We've even moved past computers being the place that we process the most information. If this McKinsey report is correct, and we're not 100% certain if it is, these types of technologies are going to push the power of computing, the power of internet, the power of digitization through all of the industries around us. And of course, higher education will also be affected. According to McKinsey, this will have a 14 to $33 trillion effect on the global economy. Global GDP right now is about $78, $79 trillion. So this will be a massive change in the way things work globally. So why does the foundation care? We care because our founders, our co-founders, uh, believe that every life has equal value. Every, every life is important in this world. And there are too many people around the world who are not able to even reach their fifth birthday uh, or live beyond 30 years of age because of diseases that we already know how to prevent or solve. And much of the funding that the Gates Foundation invests every year, about 3.6 billion last year, is in health and development globally so that as many people as possible have a chance to lead that healthy life. In the US is where we focus our education investments currently. At some point in the future, we will actually expand to global education, but right now we focus in the US because we're not taking care of our knitting here at home, which I'll explain in a couple slides. Uh, here at home, not enough students, especially low-income, disadvantaged students, uh, immigrant populations, minority populations, are not able to get out of high school, let alone get through higher education. And so we invest in American schools and colleges and innovators and research projects under the theory that you can apply the evidence philosophy that's been used in medicine to say this vaccine works in the lab, this vaccine works in phase one trials, this can work at scale. That same methodology, the scientific method, could be applied to learning science as well. Things that can be proven to work in the lab, can be proven to work in small experiments, then we can scale them. And that's what our investments are based on attempting to do to help move those populations forward. It's pretty dire in America right now. If you grow up in the top income quartile, you have a 99% chance of going to college and completing college. Congratulations. If you grow up in the bottom income quartiles, you have a much lower chance of going to college and completing college, down in the 20% range for the, the two bottom quartiles of our population here in America. Um, the way we make our investments is we look at it along a very similar lens to what you just outlined. Uh, there are innovations related to personalizing learning that there seems to be very good evidence that those actually help individualize instruction and improve student achievement. Those are good investment areas for us. There are also investment areas we call flexible. You could think of those as pathways, so certificate programs, shorter length programs, uh, credit transfer programs, ways to get students to uh, do part-time, evenings, online, anything that makes the learning process more flexible for students. Also, numerous studies about uh, positive investment areas there. Affordability is a key issue right now. It's too expensive to go to college, and I'll show you in a second how students are kind of getting around that problem. There are many important areas to invest in there. So our vision is that over the next 10 to 15 years, that we use the approximately $100 million that we invest in American higher education to make this a much more equitable system, that more low-income and disadvantaged students actually do get into and through higher education and get those credentials that lead to uh, a productive and healthy career after that. That's not the system we have right now, but that's what we're focusing our investments on. Some of our investments over the past few years, we've invested in policy initiatives, we've invested in lots of colleges and universities, 263 in fact, that we've invested in over the last five years, 
in innovators like many of you in the room, and we also invest in private entities. Uh, there are ways that foundations can do both venture-style equity investments in companies, as well as provide grants to innovators that work with colleges, schools, etc. Uh, we also come in contact not just with foundations like Lumina Foundation, which invests quite a bit in uh, higher education, about the same as we do actually. We also work closely with venture capital firms and we study what types of investments they're making in education. Many of you know that venture in education uh, had a spike in 1999 and 2000. We thought the internet was going to change everything, including education. Guess what? We should just dust off all those business plans because those business plans are getting funded now, 15 years later. And the technology is closer that can actually make a difference. Most of the hype has been around MOOCs, and we heard a uh, good story uh, yesterday about uh, how MIT OpenCourseWare was an initial point in time, and now edX and Coursera, another point in time. The venture community thinks that subscription-based models are actually the most attractive. Think lynda.com, think great courses, think straighter line, think organizations that have figured out ways to sell students a monthly subscription to the educational content that they need to get themselves ahead. Uh, we've had education's first unicorn, which is a big moment in time from our perspective. Uh, Lynda.com was purchased for $1.4 billion by LinkedIn. I think you will see many more media companies realizing that media is not so different than education, and maybe they should also think about what education companies they should purchase. And then if you think that companies like Google are media companies, as many people do, some think they're information companies, then Eventually, someone like Google will probably get into the education space in a very big way. Same with Apple, same with others of that ilk. Education is a very important uh, information economy that has not yet really been touched by those big players in any meaningful way. So, this probably will not surprise you uh, that the there's a big need for computer scientists since here we are in Silicon Valley and everybody's hunting for engineers and it's very hard to find them. But I want to tell you that if you think it's revenge of the nerds right now, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> we have an ocean of nerds coming along. We are the beginning. We're like the first 1% of nerds. Nerds do not rule the world yet. Nerds are going to rule the world in a very large way in the future. Just in the U.S. alone, there's a need for 1.4 million computer scientists in the next few years. We're not producing enough in our colleges and universities. Uh, you may be expanding your programs, but there are lots more jobs out there, and the students are finding other ways to get those computer science skills to get those jobs. This is kind of the biggest area where we say higher education disrupting in a very meaningful way. Um, you could even go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and dig into exactly what those computer science jobs and what their makeup is. These, there's a little niche computer science industries within the overall computer science uh, labor market. Um, computer science enrollment growth is going through the roof. This is University of Washington, very close to where uh, we live in Seattle. Uh, students realize that computer science jobs pay a lot more. Students like solving puzzles. This is a very practical uh, uh, job function that you can go into. I could work at a startup. It's very sexy right now. Lest you think this is just a University of Washington thing, and many of you in the room who have computer science programs know this is happening all over the place. Even with this growth, it's not enough. We actually have traditional programs growing on the left. Those are the folks I just showed on the previous slide that are growing their computer science enrollment. We have lots of other accredited programs popping up in information technology, management information systems, computer science, um, that are uh, somewhat accredited. And then we have all these other programs which were mentioned yesterday, the general assemblies, the dev boot camps, people going on edX or taking courses through Udacity and getting their nano degree. The reason for all that is not just because we're all innovative and we love computers, it's actually because there's a massive demand for these skills right now, and people are trying every way that they can to run around or through the higher education system as it exists today and get their badges or certificates or credentials. Whew, that was fast. I haven't taken a breath yet. <laughs> So going back to something else from yesterday, uh, the mention of Lumina's goal. How many of you know Lumina's goal 2025? Raise your hand if you know it. 
Oh, wow, so not very many. Most of the audiences that I talk to, it's about 80%, but here it's about 5%. So Lumina Foundation, one of our uh, sister foundations, came up with a goal back in 2009 that said by the year 2025, we want to have 60% of the American population earn a higher education degree, certificate, or credential of high value. So basically a post-secondary credential, but not just limiting it to degrees. And they had quite a bit of forethought when they invented that because it is related to that chart I showed earlier about how you can get more people in your economy up to that, that higher level of education that's needed for the 21st century. But degrees are not alone to get us there. And degrees are not necessarily for everybody either. Some people would rather get there in one year by going to the General Assembly or Dev Boot Camp or Udacity method. Other people, they actually do need the four-year program and they want to go a more traditional route. But there need to be multiple ways for folks to get there. So when we look at this disruptive sector, we see four major features that are worth mentioning to all of you as we think 15 years out, what's this higher ed ecosystem going to look like? There are accredited and non-accredited providers. And in some sense, students don't care about that anymore. If you prove that your, your graduates are getting jobs, that's what matters. That's students, it's no longer a question of are you going to college for the job or not. 80%, 90% of students are going to college to get that better job, to get that career, and especially in computer science. It's very, very obvious in that sector. Many of these uh, organizations are not skittish at all about online. MOOCs were a great wake-up call to higher education institutions all over the country that online is no longer just that backwater professional studies continuing education program. Online is the future. You need to figure out how to make online core to your university. This is what I say to presidents every week. Um, although it seems like it's a little focused on computer science and other programs like nursing, criminal justice, business, this, will, this already is crossing the entire institution. And the certif certifications and alternative credentials are not lesser. They are lesser than degrees in terms of your starting salary, but they're not lesser in terms of getting you that, that stepping stone job. Um, I won't bother going into this course except to say that many of the courses that are out there are much, much better than they used to be, and so students are demanding a higher quality course. There are now more than 100 million folks who are using applications like Minecraft that are in the generation younger, uh, and actually many of us also using Minecraft at our age. Um, but as this continues, you're going to see this is the type of educational experience that they're expecting from an online world, not kind of the static text and graphics experience that they get today. And as we talked about all throughout this event, mobile is the future. And especially in uh, international locales, people have no issue whatsoever with getting their education on a mobile device. Uh, in fact, if many of you think about it, probably you're getting most of your information on a mobile device too. So thank you very much for having us, and uh, I'm excited to see how the rest of the event goes.